and friends all gathered round There's something I would say What brings us together here Has blessed us all today Love has made a circle That holds us all inside Where strangers are as family And loneliness can't hide so give yourself to love If love is what you're after Open up your heart to Tears and laughter And give yourself to love Give yourself to love I've walked these mountains in the rain I've learned to love the wind I've been up before the sunrise To watch the day begin I always knew I'd find you Though I never did know how But like sunshine on a cloudy day You stand before me now so give yourself to love If love is what you're after Open up your heart to Tears and laughter And give yourself to love Give yourself to love Now love is born in fire It's planted like a seed Love can't give you everything But it gives you what you need Love when you are ready Love comes when you're afraid It'll be your greatest teacher Best friend you have made so give yourself to love If love is what you're after Open up your heart to Tears and laughter And give yourself to love Give yourself to love You must give yourself to love Give yourself to love Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Always such a wonderful too, way to start the service. And of course, we know that when we start the service with that gathering music, that our musician today is John Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> and our speaker today is Reverend Georgie Richardson. Yay. Very, very good, too. Because I'm really anxious to hear what you're going to talk about today. In case anybody didn't notice in the bulletin, the subject today is the game of money and how to play it. <laughs> Sounds fascinating. <laughs> anyway, welcome so much to all of you that are here today. Um, I think we're with the rain outside at our house this morning before we came in, we'd already had three quarters of an inch of rain. And so it's been a little bit of a downpour here and there. But I think this is an absolute blessing because I feel that we really need it in the forests and all of the different areas that, you know, to help with the forest fires and to keep them from happening. So it's out there going, oh, it's raining. Oh, yeah, thank you, God. <laughs> After all, I'll regroup. Thank you, God. <laughs> when I could find the button to the windshield wipers. <laughs> well, that would be nice. Yes. Because usually, someplace where we're parking our cars that we don't know where, the birds are finding us on both of our cars. And all the time it's been raining recently, the cars have been in the garage. <laughs> so, I'm still getting... Well, the old isn't gone yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> and for some reason or another, washing the cars just does not seem to fit into my schedule. Now we got birds in our barn, but I haven't heard of birds in the garage. So yeah. I'm just wondering. Yeah. We and cover our track. Absolutely. That's what he keeps saying. He said, you know, you better not leave that back door open to the garage. That's probably where it's coming from. <laughs> I said, I don't think so. <laughs> but anyway, welcome. So nice to see you all today. And with that, I'm going to light the Christ candle. And just <clears throat> strictly as a reminder, the reason we light the Christ candle every Sunday is because it's a vis visual reminder of the Christ light. It is within all of us at all points in time. And that includes everybody. Not, not, not just us and here, but all of them out there everywhere. And that Christ is in everyone. So sometimes take an extra look at that and try. I take an extra look at it and try and remember it. That light's in them too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to ask Georgie if she will do the opening prayer, please. Thank you, Judy. Good morning, everyone. Let's just close our eyes if that is comfortable <clears throat> to you, for you, and take a deep breath, and then let go. We just let go of the busyness and the hurrying to get here this morning. And we thank you, sweet spirit, for the invitation to be here this morning. Yes, indeed, that light of the divine presence, that light of the Christ, burns within each and every one of us. And it is a good thing to have the reminder with the Christ light. And we can turn our own Christ light on. We can write, light a candle at home, or we can be aware of that Christ light within ourselves with everything that we think and everything that we do. And so we are grateful for this opportunity this morning just to be reminded of that, that divine presence within us all. Thank you, Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Georgie. And now we're going to do the congregational song and you will find the words of it printed in your bulletin, on a sheet in your bulletin, and I've lost mine again. We sang this last week, too. Yes. <laughs> and, I, and I cut it short. Do you want me to add a verse this week so we can make up for it? This one of his favorites that he's really wanting us to learn, so he's really hitting us with it. <laughs> So we'll do a good job. Alright. Sim shalom, sim shalom, tova uvrakan. Sim shalom, sim shalom, tova uvrakan. Sim shalom, sim shalom, tova uvrakan. Sim shalom. Tova We each hold a gift, man and woman, boy and girl. There's as many pieces of this gift as people in the world. And if we put them all together, maybe we can find a way to build a peaceful world one day. Sim shalom, sim shalom, tova uvraka. Sim shalom, sim shalom, tova uvraka. Sim shalom, sim shalom, tova uvraka. Sim shalom, tova uvraka. 
Each hold a gift, man and woman, boy and girl. There's as many pieces of this gift as people in the world. And if put them all together, maybe we can find a way to build a peaceful world one day. Sim Shalom, Sim Shalom, Tova Uvracha. Sim Shalom, Sim Shalom, Tova Uvracha. Sim Shalom, Sim Shalom, Tova Uvracha. Sim Shalom, Tova Uvracha. Sim Shalom. Thank you, John. <coughs> Georgie. <laughs> Somebody just snuck in. <laughs> yeah. Snuck in. They snuck in. <laughs> okay, at this point in time, <clears throat> I remind everybody of the prayer box. And I know, especially of late, I've been using it more than ever. <laughs> you know, it just, but as always, the um, prayer requests are on the back of the pew things. So if you have a request, uh, please fill it out, put it in the bowls when they come around, back in our prayer circle, or directly in the box yourself if you like. And I always like to remember that this isn't only a Gee, I need or whatever. I also like to use it as a thank you, God. Just a reminder of that and saying, ah, yeah, I do appreciate this and such or whatever. Or that little intuition that keeps popping up lately. Thank you for that one. <laughs> so that's what that one's all about. And it says next is announcements, but I don't know. John has an announcement. Do you? We do an opening prayer and I missed it. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good one too. It was John. a good one, John. It. When when you record or do whatever you do with when you video this thing, pay attention to it. Georgie had a really nice opening prayer, and I'm very sorry you missed it. Where were you? <laughs> Since he hasn't left the room, I know where he was. I was lost, but now I'm found. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so enough for the announcements at this point in time. I'm going to ask Blythe if she will please do our daily word. I know, I, I've lost my place too. Have you found it? It's affirmations. I'm going, oh, wait a minute. Didn't do the affirmations yet. Okay, let's go for the yellow card that's in your bulletin and we'll do the affirmation. And we'll do the one for unity by the sea first, please. Unity by the sea is the light of God expressing. And on the reverse side for ourselves, I am the light of God expressing. And so it is. Now, Blythe, would you do the daily word, please? You betcha. I'll give it to you. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Divine wisdom. Yeah. I embody the wisdom of infinite mind. In his poem, The Answer, Lowell Fillmore describes reaching the limits of human understanding and pausing, quote, to give my weary brain a rest, unquote. He writes, quote, in that still moment after self had tried and failed, there came a glorious vision of God's power, and lo, my prayer was answered in that hour. I bless my intellect and give thanks for all the insights it has provided. At the same time, I accept the limits of intellectual understanding. The gifts of God, the Apostle Paul tells us, must be spiritually discerned. In prayer, I let God be God in me. 
I let go of intellectual understanding. I align my mind and heart with divine wisdom. I trust the infinite mind in me and allow it to guide my path. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's spirit, for they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14. And now we're going to have another song from John, right? Yep, we are. Actually, George is responsible for this song. <laughs> Probably eight or ten years ago, she was going to speak on prosperity at Unity in Salem. And I was up on stage, or I was, going, I was slated to be up on stage the following week, and I could not find a prayer, <laughs> I mean, a, a song about prosperity or anything. But we had just sung Turn, Turn, Turn by Pete Seeger that was, you know, stolen from Ecclesiastes. <laughs> so I said, well, I can do something like that. <laughs> so I was going to go to the gospel. I knew there was this thing about the birds of the air and, and all that stuff, and I didn't know where it was, so I took Bly's uh, Bible down from the shelf, and opened it and there in the bottom right corner was Gospel of St. Matthew with this little, that I forget what the, what the citation is, but um, uh, anyway, so I sang it then, I'll sing it for you now, because Georgie I think is speaking somewhat about prosperity today. Wise man walked this earth long time ago, pointed to the birds, said this you gotta know, they don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather in the store, but the Father takes good care of them, for you he'll do much more. Open your heart and feel the glow, open your hands now, let the bounty flow, there's plenty here for everyone, don't settle for less, just take what you need and leave the rest. Pointed to the lilies growing in the soil Said they don't fret, they don't worry, they don't spin or toil but The Father dresses him so gloriously Imagine what he'll do for you and for me Open your heart and feel the glow Open your hands now, let the body flow there's plenty here for everyone don't settle for less take what you need and leave the rest so ask and you'll receive seek and you will find knock and every door will be open to you open your mind open your heart open your hands let the bounty start open your heart feel the glow open your hands now let the body flow there's plenty here for everyone don't settle for less take what you need leave all the rest Thank you, John. That was really neat. That's a cool one. I like that. I like the attitude of it. And now it is my pleasure to turn everything over to Georgie. Thank you, Junior. You're up, kid. Okay. Well, John, thank you so much for that song. And and as you uh, as you sang the song. And, and I got into the rhythm, and CJ and Ginger just came in, and I suddenly had a picture, CJ, of you jumping up, grabbing Lisa Hublitz, and the two of you dancing to it. <laughs> About right? Probably did. <laughs> Probably did is absolutely right. Probably did. This was, ap that was just couldn't be more apropos. All I did was give John just the title. And wait until you listen here, and you'll see how, how well it fit. Just absolutely perfect. So like Judy said, I'm going to talk about the game of money and how to play it. 
you know, money figures into just about every segment of our life. It has its tentacles out there in just about every segment of our lives. And I, I would almost bet that there's nobody in this room, there's probably nobody any place who hasn't had a bout of fear or anxiety around the idea of money. And it doesn't matter how much or how little we have. There's still that anxiety that can crop up inside of us around money. So today I plan to give you three things. I'm going to give you, first of all, a way to back yourself out of those fear thoughts when they do come up. Okay? The second th I'm going, thing I'm going to give you today is some thoughts and maybe new ones, I hope, about the idea of scarcity. And the third thing is some new ideas on a consciousness of sufficiency. And I underline that word consciousness because we know that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Okay. Lynn Twist wrote a book in 2003, and I'm sure some of you who hung out with me at Unity of Salem all those years, you, you remember me uh, quoting from this book. Um, it is just an excellent book. I have, you know, I've given away probably two-thirds of all my books uh, since I retired. Don't need them all. But I have one shelf on healing and one shelf on prosperity. And without a doubt, this book is the best of either one of those two shelves. The Soul of Money. Okay? You can get it on Kindle if you want. It was ten bucks, I think. And Paula and I are reading it together uh, at night before we go to sleep. And, um, and it, it's just absolutely a powerful, powerful book. I think I have more highlighted sections in this book than not. So, so this is what I'm kind of working with today. Think, if you will, for just a moment about a game board, OK? You have a starting square, and you have a finished square. Okay, you have a little token, which is you. That little token represents you. You have some dice or die, each, whatever way you say it. And as you toss the dice, then it gives you a number, and you move your token that far on the game board, right? So today, think of that symbolically as that toss of the dice is a decision on how to spend money or about money. Okay? Now, our game board in this game of money and how to play it has squares on it that you're going to pop on, onto, but it has different words than most game boards does. It'll have fear in there and anxiety in there and freaking out. <laughs> okay? <laughs> but it also has contentment, gratitude, peace of mind, joy. Uh, same game board, all right? So this has to do with all of your life decisions. Now, you roll the dice, you make a decision, and then you move your token the required number of, of jumps. If you land on fear or anxiety, you either take four steps back or you miss a turn, or maybe two turns, or maybe three turns. Kind of de depends if you land on fear or freaking out how many tur <laughs> turns you have to miss, OK? Of course, landing on contentment and peace of mind has its own rewards as well. Now, the first thing I want to do is give you this gift that will help you back away from the fear or the freaking out or whatever it might be. And, and it's, it's a, a mantra uh, that will help you as you step into those major decisions around money. Let me ask you some questions first. And just raise your hand if the answer is yes. Do you have clothes on your body this morning? <laughs> Good job, Ginger. For a minute, you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> just want to make sure. OK. Do you have food on your table at home? Do you have a roof over your head? When you leave here and go home, do you have a roof over your head? OK, good. You're all in the affirmative. This is going to be a real easy one for you, OK? The, man, the mantra goes like this. Today, in this now moment. Now, you've got to say that. 
okay? Because there is no past and there is no future. There is just now, in this now moment. So it's very important that when you say this mantra, you start there, today, in this now moment. I have clothes on my body, food on my table, and a roof over my head. I have sufficiency. I am safe. I am enough. Okay. And you, pardon? Slow down. Oh, I'm going to say it several times. And I'll say it, I'll say it one more time before I go on. Uh, but you will find the power in that mantra will immediately take you out of that corner that fear is trying to push you into. It's just that kind of a reminder. Okay, I'll say it again. Today, in this now moment, I have clothes on my body, food on my table, a roof over my head. I have sufficiency. I am safe. I am enough. Now I'll say it again, Judy, as we go along. Okay. Okay. Remember, something is not a problem unless we declare it a problem. Life is all about consciousness, and so is the game of money and how to play it. All about consciousness. All about our perceptions. Okay. So that was the first thing I wanted to give you today. So now we're going to talk about this idea of scarcity. Lynn Twist says this to us. No matter who we are, or what our circumstances, we swim in conversations about what there isn't enough of. Okay. She talks about the myths that have been passed down from generation to generation about scarcity. Myths like, there is not enough. I remember my stepdad saying, you know, that we had to choose our career very, very carefully because there's only one pie out there and you've got to get your piece of it. And you've got to work hard to do that. And when we hear those things as a child, we may not even quite understand what it means, but they drip down inside of us, especially when somebody, like my stepdad, believes it so much and says it so often that it's a constant drip into the consciousness of the child. Okay? And pretty soon, you don't even realize that that's what you believe, and, but that's, that's, what it, that's the way it is, right? So, <clears throat> this, is, this is a big one, okay? Uh, the idea that there is not enough to go around, everyone can't make it, someone's going to be left behind, there are way too many people, there's not enough food, there's not enough water, there's not enough air or time, and there certainly is not enough money. Certainly. Myths and superstitions have power over us only to the extent that we believe in them. I'm going to say that one again. Myths and superstitions have power over us only to the extent that we believe in them. But when we do believe in them, Lynn says, we live completely under their spell and their fiction. So the first myth about scarcity is there's not enough. Now the second myth is more is better. You know, we were on our way over today and this lesson was kind of rolling around a little bit in my head. And I thought of that second myth, more is better. And I remember my mom so many times, you know, like if she was going to uh, put some Vicks on our chest because we had a cold, you know, and she'd say, a little bit is good, but more is better. <laughs> Not, it, 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 that's how insidious these things get into our consciousness and we start to live our lives by that. More is better, okay? So a consciousness of fear that there is not enough and that more is better drives a competitive culture of accumulation, acquisition, and greed that in turn heightens fear and the pace of the race. More is better is a chase with no end and a race with no winners. Okay. Even the very wealthiest among us, I mean, if you're a billionaire, 
We no longer talk about millionaires. Now we have billionaires all over. Okay. If you're a billionaire, they too are driven by this fear is more is bit better. Just think about it. Is one home enough? Yeah. Even one big home? Yeah. Not usually. They all have homes all over the place, both ends of the, of the United States, so you can go from one home to the other and other countries. Cars, the biggest and the best, a fleet of cars. You've got to have a fleet of cars. And how about getting into college? We all know that scandal that's still cooking and going through the courts, don't we? Okay. And then you get a boat, but pretty soon you need a yacht because more is better. Never mind that little airplane. Give me a jet. More is better. So they are driven with this probably more than some of the rest of us, this more is better. The third myth that drives this idea of scarcity is that's just the way it is and there's nothing we can do about it. Oh, whoa. It's life, it's karma, it's God's will, okay? And Lynn says that this myth is probably the one that has the most grip to it because we can always make a case for it. So I want to share a little bit, and I'm going to be sharing from the book just a little bit, just because she says it so well. I, I can't encourage you enough to get this book. It is so good. It is so rich. She's a great writer, and she's got so many stories in here that just kind of blow your mind. Okay, so this is what she says here about this idea of that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is presents one of the toughest pieces of transforming our relationship with money. Because if you can't let go of the chase and shake off the helplessness and the cynicism it eventually generates, then you're stuck. If you're not willing to question that, then it's hard to dislodge the thinking that got you stuck. We have to be willing to let go of that's just the way it is, even if just for a moment. Now, now that's a very interesting statement there. Even if it's just for a moment. Do you, you know, the Course in Miracles says, if you have a willingness, just a little bit of willingness, just for a moment, the Holy Spirit will rush in. So if we can truly let go of something, just for a moment, a shift in consciousness can happen. So just for a moment, to consider the possibility that there isn't a way it is, and there isn't a way it isn't. There is the way we choose to act and what we choose to make of circumstances. Back down to choice, isn't it? Okay. Lynn, uh, for many, many years, was involved with the Hunger Project, okay? And she was deeply committed herself to end world hunger. She traveled all over the world seeing the results of hunger. She was a fundraiser, okay? She raised millions and millions of dollars, and yet hunger seemed to continue to exist until she became aware of these myths and how they were starving people to death. The myths themselves. At the time she wrote the book, and I would guess it might be a higher number now, 41,000 people a day, and, that's, and mostly children, were dying of hunger and hunger-related conditions. 41,000 people a day. That's three times how many people live in Dallas. That's a lot of people per day, per day, okay? In discovering, as she worked with all of this, and in discovering these myths about scarcity and exposing them things began to shift. Let me see what she says here about that. She said, the Hunger Pod Project, by systematically challenging false assumptions about chronic hunger and food aid, exposed the myth of scarcity and opened new avenues of inquiry and possibility, eventually succeeding 
in making a significant contribution to the eradication of hunger by empowering people to author their own recovery. There we are with don't give them a fish, teach them how to fish. Okay? In every situation, from individuals to large populations of people, uncovering the lie and the myths of scarcity has been the first and the most powerful step in transformation from helplessness and resignation to possibility and self-reliance. Okay. Now, what I'm giving you today is the tiniest thimbleful of wisdom and knowledge from this book. Okay, I can't possibly pack it all in. I was thinking it, it probably would make a wonderful class just to read and discuss. But anyhow, I'm bringing it to you in this way. <clears throat> now, to the third gift. Okay, the, 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 first, second, the first gift was the mantra. The second gift was those thoughts about scarcity. Now, the third gift, okay. And if you can embrace this idea, you will diminish your fear and anxiety around and about money down to a small fraction which you can then totally wipe out with your mantra. Because today, in this now moment, I have clothes on my body, food on my table, a roof over my head. I have sufficiency. I am safe. I am enough. It's all about consciousness, friends. Okay, so, and it's a constant vigilance that we need to keep in order to watch our consciousness. To watch those things bubble up, you know, and maybe wonder, where did that come from? I better take a look at that, okay? Just being aware constantly of what, what our consciousness is feeding us. Because that's what we're living. That's what we're living. Okay, now we're going to talk about sufficiency. Now, sometimes we might look at a person and say, that person is self-sufficient, okay? Meaning that we know that person is adequate to the end proposed. That's what self-sufficiency is. Adequate to the end proposed. We know that person has the skills, the tools, the passion, the desire, etc., to complete whatever end of the situation looks like, of building a house, repairing something, uh, creating something whatsoever, okay? Uh, I know that CJ is very handy uh, remodeling houses, <laughs> to put it in just that, that simply. And if I had uh, a portion of my house that I, I needed maybe some new tile in or I needed some ideas about it, I would know that I could call CJ and she'd come over and she'd give me some very good ideas because I know she's very self-sufficient in that way. Okay, So self-sufficiency is a person who is adequate to the end proposed. Now, each of us is truly adequate to the end proposed. When we address life from that deeper or that higher truth about ourselves. And that is why this mantra is so powerful. Because every time we say it, we are reminding ourselves what we just affirmed today, I am the light of God expressing. That's what we're reminding ourselves of when we say, in this today, in this now moment, I have clothes on my body, food on my table, roof over my head. I have sufficiency. I am safe. I am enough. So we're not only, we're not only putting aside that fear by reminding ourselves that we have that sufficiency in our life, we are affirming as well, I have sufficiency, I am safe, I am enough, I am the light of God expressing. Okay, exactly, so that was a good one for this month, Judy. Okay. 
right. When we use that mantra, we are affirming our own self-sufficiency. We are enough. We truly are enough. Now, I'm going to read a little bit more from the book instead of paraphrasing it and pulling it out into my message because Lynn says it so much better than I can, and I just didn't feel a need to change your words. So bear with me here. I don't usually read too much, uh, but th it, this is so good. Okay. We each have the choice in any setting to step back and let go of the mindset of scarcity. Once we let go of scarcity, we discover the surprising truth of sufficiency. By sufficiency, I don't mean a quantity of anything. Take that in a minute now. By sufficiency, I don't mean a quantity of anything. Sufficiency isn't two steps up from poverty or one step short of abundance. It isn't a measure of barely enough or more than enough. Sufficiency isn't an amount at all. It is an experience, a context we generate, a declaration, a knowing that there is enough and that we are enough. Sufficiency resides inside each one of us, and we can call it forward. It is a consciousness, an attention, an intentional choosing of the way we think about our circumstances. In our relationship with money, it is using money in a way that expresses our integrity, using it in a way that expresses value rather than determines value. Using it in a way that expresses value rather than determines value. Sufficiency is not a message <clears throat> about simplicity or about cutting back and lowering expectations. Sufficiency doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, uh, strive or aspire. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sufficiency is an act of generating, distinguishing, making known to ourselves the power and the presence of our existing resources and our inner resources. Sufficiency is a context we bring forth from within that reminds us that if we look around us and within ourselves, we will find what we need. There is always enough. When we live in the context of sufficiency, we find a natural freedom and integrity. We engage in life from a sense of our own wholeness rather than a desperate longing to be complete. We feel naturally called to share the resources that flow, flow through our lives, our time, our money, our wisdom, our energy, or what, at whatever level those resources flow, to serve our highest commitments in the context of sufficiency and the flow of resources to and through and from us, our soul and our money interests merge to create a rich, satisfying, and meaningful life. Sufficiency is the truth. Sufficiency can be a place to stand, a context that generates a completely new relationship with life, with money, and with everything that money can buy. Just one more little piece here. I am not suggesting that there is ample water in the desert or food for the beggars. Bombay, in Bombay, I am saying that even in the presence of genuine scarcity of external resources, the desire and capacity for self-sufficiency are innate and enough to meet the challenges we face. It is precisely when we turn our attention to these inner resources, in fact, only when we do that, that we can begin to see more clearly the sufficiency in us and available to us, and we can begin to generate <coughs> a 
effective, sustainable responses to whatever limitations of resources confront us. When we let go of the chase for more and consciously, <coughs> excuse me, and consciously examine and experience the resources we already have, we discover our resources are deeper than we knew or imagined. In the nourishment of our attention, our assets expand and grow. Today in this now moment, I have clothes on my body, food on my table, a roof over my head. I have sufficiency. I am safe. I am enough. Let's take this inside. And John, you can play or not. It doesn't matter. If you would rather just take it inside, okay. All right. Okay, I invite you to take a deep breath and let it go. Let's take another one. Breathing in and breathing out. Sweet spirit, how could we be anything except enough? Collectively, we are the Son of God, the daughter of God. And it is God's great good pleasure to give us the kingdom, Jesus said to us. The kingdom, that's sufficiency. Our creator knows that we need food on our table and clothes on our body and a roof of our head and would withhold nothing from us. But if our mind is so captured with these myths of there's not enough, more is better, that's just the way it is. If we are locked into our own prison with these myths of scarcity, how can the Holy Spirit reach us? All the Holy Spirit can do is wait. Wait for us to awaken. Wait for us to realize that it truly is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. And that every time we jump into fear and anxiety or go freaking out about there's not enough, oh my God, look at my bank account, it's below zero, or whatever it is that scares us so badly, we run right back into that jail cell and pull the door closed behind us. Then we go in a corner and sit and shake until we remember that in this now moment, I have clothes on my body. Even sitting in the corner in this jail cell I have created for myself, I have clothes on my body. And there's some food on my table too. And even in this jail cell, there's a roof over my head. Maybe I do have sufficiency. Maybe I can step out of this jail cell. In fact, I'll bet I can simply tell it to disappear. We can say to that mountain of fear, be gone. And it will be another promise of Jesus, our teacher, our brother, our way shore. It is that simple. This whole thing about money, sweet spirit, is nothing more than a game. It's a game we play with ourselves. Oh my, oh my, oh my. It is time that we wake up and embrace the sufficiency of the kingdom 
that Jesus told us, it was your good pleasure to give to us, dear God. I want to take just a minute and I will be silent as you take this meditation wherever you're going to take it inside yourself. Thank you, sweet spirit, for the reminder this morning. <clears throat> Truly, I am the light of God expressing. And so it is. Amen. And now just take a moment, and when you can feel yourself sitting on your seat, then you may open your eyes. Thank you, spirit. And now we have an opportunity to share some of that sufficiency <clears throat> by giving our tithes and our offerings to support Unity by the Sea. And so I would invite you just to take your gift in your hands. Get the feel of that sufficiency. Feel the life in it. It is energy. That's all it is, is energy. So it has a pulse beat, just like all energy does. And join me in the offering blessing. Divine love through me blesses and all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God. <laughs> Sometimes you have to chase down the tools of your trade. <laughs> God in the clear running water, growing to greatness, the trees on the hill, spirit of God in the fingers of morning, fill the earth, bring it to birth, and blow where you will, blow, blow, blow till I be but breath of the Spirit blowing in me. Deep in the meadow, the willows are moaning. Sheep in the pasture land cannot lie still. Spirit of God, creation is groaning. Fill the earth, bring it to birth, and blow where you will. Blow, blow, blow till I be but breath of the Spirit blowing in me. I saw the scar of a year that lay dying, heard the lament of a lone whippoorwill. Spirit of God, see that cloud crying, fill the earth. Bring it to birth and blow where you will. Blow, blow, blow till I be but breath of the Spirit blowing in me. Spirit of God, everyone's heart is lonely, watching and waiting 
hungry until Spirit of God we long that you only fill the earth bring it to birth and blow where you will blow 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 till I be but breath of the Spirit blowing in me oh blow 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 till I be but breath of the Spirit blowing in me. Sister Miriam Therese Winter, the singing nun, medicine missionaries, medical missionaries, yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. Join me in prayer, please. We are so grateful, dear God, to open our consciousness to the sufficiency. And as we do it for ourselves, Individually, we do it, we do it by the sea as well. There is sufficiency. And so we bless these gifts. We bless the givers. And we send them forth out into the world to do the good that they are meant to do. Good morning. Please join with me in reading our statement for peace. Unity stands for peace in the presence of conflict, for love in the presence of hatred, for forgiveness in the presence of injury. Unity honors the many names for God, the many paths to God, the many ways to worship God, for there is only one power and presence of God and that God loves each one of us equally. It is therefore the position of unity to urge all nations, their leaders, and their people to turn to God by whatever the name for guidance during these challenging times and to pursue peace, not war. For this is what honors the God of all our faith traditions. Unity stands for peace in our lifetime. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. I will not be the part of the killing of any child, no matter how lofty the reason. Not my neighbor's child, not my child, not my enemy's child. Not by bomb, not by bullet, not by looking the other way. I will be the power that is peace.